Well, good evening, church family. Welcome to Wednesday Night Recharge. Uh, certainly pray that you are doing well. On Wednesday nights, we've been walking through uh, a topic of what is so awful about pride. It's just a sermon series that I put together. Believe it or not, I don't know if you're here every week, but there is actually an order and there are, uh, I'm going somewhere with this. So let me, let me quickly recap uh, for you. So the problem of pride is, is the hindrance to the gospel. It's pride, okay? The reason people do not come to salvation in Jesus Christ is pride. That's why it's titled, What's So Awful About Pride? This first section, we're looking completely vertical. And man in his pride wants to be independent from God. Independent from God. And the first, uh, the first kind of deep dive we did, we looked at the fact that he is the eternal creator and we are dependent beings. And pride is, makes us so stinking delusional because even though we are as dependent as we are, we, we want to usurp the fact that he's the creator, okay? And then uh, last week, we, we dove deep into this idea that not only is he the eternal creator, he is also the holy king. He's the holy king. And yet we want to declare our own truths. We don't want to follow his leadership or his authority, even though he has all authority because he's our creator and he rules upon the throne. We want to declare our own truths. So we spent two weeks on, on those two things. And so this evening, I want you to see <coughs> the next piece that I want to add to this. Not only is he the eternal creator, not only is he the holy king, but the scripture also paints another picture that is even more shocking whenever it comes to our pride. And that is this, that God is good. Amen. That God is good and he pursues us. God is good and he pursues us. So I want to paint for you a few quick pictures. Uh, two of them are in parables that Jesus gives that paint this picture. The first one is out of Matthew chapter 22. It'll be on the screen. Matthew 22, uh, verses 2 through 6. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. And he sent out his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding feast. But they were unwilling to come. Again, he sent out other slaves saying, tell those who have been invited, behold, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen, my fatted livestock are all butchered. Everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went their, their own way. One to his own farm, another to his business, the, the rest, and then the rest seized his slaves and mistreated them and killed them. Okay, so pause right there. What I want you to notice about this parable that Jesus sets up, first of all, it is a good thing that God is inviting you to, isn't it? Like, he's a, he's a benevolent king. He's inviting you to a wedding feast, the wedding feast of his son. He has abundant provision and blessing when you get there, okay? There's abundance that overflows. Who doesn't want to go to a wedding feast? And yet, when the invitation goes out, they don't want to go. They don't want to come and celebrate the son, in fact, in Luke, he tells a, a parallel parable. And in Luke, they, they are full of excuses. They say, I just bought a piece of land. I got stuff to do. I just bought a bunch of oxen. I got stuff to do. I just got married. Now, what that has to do with anything, I don't know. Okay? It's not like he was married that day. Okay? So, full of excuses. In other words, my world is too important to be concerned about going and celebrating the sun. 
That's pride, right? That God is a good God, and he is pursuing you, and yet you were unwilling. Next picture I want to paint. Scripture is full of this idea, the marriage of God to his people, the bride, that his people, that we are his bride, and that God is as a husband who is pursuing his bride, okay? Scripture's full of this idea. It's a thread that runs through the entirety of Scripture, but some common landing spots. One is, is in Ezekiel. It's very important to understand that God as husband is the pursuer. In Ezekiel, it's a really vivid image that he uses in Ezekiel chapter 15. He said, when I found you, you were an infant squirming in your blood. You were so helpless You were cast off. You were discarded. You were left for infanticide. Like someone just left you. Your mom left you on the side of the road. You were completely helpless. And I came and I cleaned you. And I nurtured you. And I clothed you. And you grew into your beauty. And I dressed you and adorned you and put gold rings uh, on your ears and in your nose and clothed you with beautiful garments. I, I raised you up and you became beautiful. Okay? So what's so important in all of that is to, is to know that God is the pursuer. He is the benevolent pursu- uh, pursuer. But, now you ought to strike me dead for saying what I'm about to say. The Bible continues and says, but you are unfaithful to me. That the bride, the people of God, leave God, they commit adultery, and they turn and they run the other way. And God sits there as the cuckold husband, the one who has been cheated on and desires his wife to come back, but she wants no part of him. Think about that picture. And what I'm trying to articulate tonight, that God is good and that God pursues you. Third image. It's a parable just before in Matthew 21, where we were previously. And Jesus tells another parable about, now about a vineyard owner. Let me read. He tells a parable about uh, a vineyard owner. He's planted A beautiful vineyard. He's made it awesome. Um, uh, And he's gone away on vacation, but some some people have taken over his vineyard. The workers have taken over the vineyard. And so he sends a servant back, and they, they kill the servant. And then he sends more servants back, and they kill another one and stoned a third. Again, he sent another group of slaves, larger than the first, And they did the same thing to them. Verse 37. But afterwards, he sent his son to them, saying, they will respect my son. But when the vineyard growers saw the son, they said amongst themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and seize his inheritance. And they took him, threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those vine growers? So what I want you to notice about this parable and the way that these are all set up is, number one, God is the owner. He is the one in authority, right? He's the creator. He's the king. He is the one in authority. But pride has made man so delusional, so delusional that they think that they can undo God's ownership, that they can just cast God off and be in control themselves. No longer recognize him as creator, as king, as the one in authority. But what's so incredible is he sends his son. And what we know about the gospel is the the son comes and gives a call 
to all. Come. I've given my son. He has died in your stead. You come. Bow down and find life in me. But repeatedly, pride is so awful and so delusional that you're unwilling. Unwilling. What has he not done? What has he not done? He is good. And he pursues us. And he offers a feast. And he pictures himself as a husband. And he's even given his son. Which is why Christians should be the most humble people on the planet, right? Because we know what he's done for us and we know what makes us Christians is in no way prideful. It's all about him. Look at what he's done. Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, as we consider, as we consider all that you have done to pursue us, as we consider your goodness, your goodness, that in your right hand you satisfy the desire of every living thing. Oh my goodness, there is no God like you. That to be in your presence is to be filled with joy. That you are a delight. There is no one that could satisfy our souls like you. Father, root out our pride and allow us to see with even more clarity how good you are and the fact that you pursue us. And allow us to walk around and shine that light full of humility to everyone around us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.